I was driving home after a late shift at the diner, exhausted, with the quiet hum of the engine as my only companion on the dark, deserted highway. The night was unusually still, the kind of silence that presses in on your ears, making every other sound too loud. I remember thinking I should have felt peaceful, but instead, there was this gnawing unease at the pit of my stomach, growing with each passing mile. Suddenly, red and blue lights flashed in my rearview mirror, piercing the monotony of the road. I wasn't speeding, my tags were up to date, and I hadn't had a drop to drink. Confused but not overly worried, I pulled over, rolling down my window as the patrol car came to a stop behind me. The door opened, and a cop stepped out, his figure looming large against the blinding spotlight. Evening, officer, I greeted, trying to keep my voice steady. Is there a problem? He didn't respond right away, just stood there, scrutinizing me with a cold, unblinking stare that sent a shiver down my spine. Then, without a word, he walked back to his car. I watched him in the mirror, trying to shake off the chill that had settled over me. That's when I saw it. Another figure in the passenger seat of the patrol car slumped over, unnaturally still. Panic clenched my stomach. I wanted to drive away, but fear rooted me to the spot. The officer returned, his hand resting on his gun belt. Step out of the vehicle, he commanded, his voice devoid of any emotion. Why? What did I do? I stammered, but he just repeated his demand, more insistently this time. My heart was racing as I complied, stepping out into the chilly night air, the sense of danger growing more acute. As I stood there, the officer's eyes darted around, as if checking for unseen witnesses. Then, in a swift motion, he drew his gun, aiming it right at me. Walk, he ordered, nodding toward the dense woods lining the highway. Every instinct screamed to run, but the cold barrel of the gun pressed against my back was a deadly incentive to obey. We walked in silence, leaves crunching underfoot, the woods swallowing us in their dark embrace. I didn't know why this was happening, but the lifeless form in the car was a silent testament to this man's deadly intent. Breaking the silence, I asked, why are you doing this? My voice sounded foreign to my own ears, choked with fear. He didn't answer. Instead, he pushed me forward, deeper into the forest. That's when I heard it, a faint rustling noise to our right. The officer paused, his head snapping toward the sound, and in that split second of distraction, I saw my chance. I elbowed him in the stomach and bolted, not daring to look back. Gunshots rang out behind me, the sound deafening in the quiet woods. I dodged between trees, heart pounding, expecting any moment to feel the lethal kiss of a bullet. But I kept running, driven by sheer survival instinct, until I saw lights through the trees. Gasping for breath, I emerged onto another road just as a car came into view. Waving my arms frantically, I screamed for help. The car screeched to a halt, and the driver, a middle-aged woman, looked at me with wide eyes. He's trying to kill me, I gasped, glancing fearfully back at the dark forest. Without hesitation, she unlocked the door, and I dove in, urging her to drive. She took off, her phone in her shaking hand as she dialed 911, reporting what little she knew of my frantic plea. The next hours were a blur of police lights, questioning officers, and the dawning horror of what had transpired. The crooked cop, they explained, had killed his partner earlier that night, a deed I had unwittingly witnessed. They found his abandoned patrol car, the body of his partner still inside, but the cop himself had vanished into the night. In the days that followed, the story unfolded in the news, a manhunt for a murderer in uniform. I couldn't shake the image of his cold, calculating eyes, the ease with which he'd pulled the trigger, intending to add me to his list of silenced threats. The experience left me with nightmares, a fear of dark, lonely roads, and a profound distrust of those sworn to protect. But more than that, it left me with a chilling realization of how close I had come to being a mere footnote in a tale of corruption and murder, my final moments lost in the silent, uncaring expanse of the woods. The night was unusually dark as I drove home from the late night service at the church. The winding roads of rural America were empty, with only my headlights cutting through the thick blanket of darkness. The sermon about the battle between good and evil still echoed in my mind, leaving me with a lingering sense of unease. As I rounded a sharp bend,
My headlights illuminated a lone figure standing by the side of the road, thumb outstretched. Against my better judgment, I slowed down, the stories of hitchhiking ghosts and murderers I'd heard growing up in the back of my mind. The figure stepped forward into the light, revealing a man in his mid-thirties, with piercing eyes and a disturbingly serene smile. Thank you for stopping, he said, his voice smooth as he slid into the passenger seat. I'm headed north, as far as you're going. There was something off about him, but the cold, Christian guilt from the service compelled me to offer help. As we drove, he talked about the universe's chaotic nature, his words weaving a disturbing narrative that contrasted sharply with the calm I'd felt just hours before at the church. He spoke of his followers, people who sought truth beyond the mundane, and how they found solace in rituals that aligned them with deeper realities. The air in the car thickened. The darkness outside seemed to press against the windows, and a suffocating fear began to grow in my chest. I realized then that I was not just sharing a car with a man, but with someone who saw himself as a conduit to something darker, something evil. In a voice that was barely a whisper, I asked, what kind of rituals? His smile widened, and in the pale glow of the dashboard, his eyes seemed to flicker with a sinister light. The kind that require purity and sacrifice. He replied, his tone casual, as if discussing the weather. My heart pounded, and I suddenly felt very alone, very vulnerable. The road stretched endlessly ahead, flanked by dark, dense forests. I thought of stopping, of demanding he get out, but a paralyzing fear gripped me. The stories I'd heard of devil worshippers and occult leaders flashed through my mind, merging with the man beside me into a living nightmare. As if sensing my fear, he chuckled softly. You Christians always fear what you don't understand, he murmured, turning to face me, his face inches from mine. But don't worry, I don't need your understanding, just your cooperation. Panicked, I slammed on the brakes, the car screeching to a halt. Get out, I shouted, my voice trembling. He laughed a sound that chilled my blood, but opened the door and stepped out into the night. We'll meet again, he said, his eyes locking onto mine, holding me in a terrified trance until he closed the door. I drove off at breakneck speed, not stopping until I reached the safety of my home. I didn't sleep that night, or many nights after, jumping at shadows and starting at every sound. Weeks passed, and I tried to convince myself it had been a figment of my overworked imagination, a story conjured up by the solitude of the road and the late-hour sermon. But the peace was short-lived. In the dead of night, a frantic knocking shattered the silence of my home. Heart racing, I opened the door to find a young woman, her eyes wide with terror, her clothes stained with blood. He's here. He's found me, she gasped, collapsing into my arms. I called 911, my hands shaking, as I tried to make sense of her ramblings about rituals, sacrifices, and a leader who commanded the shadows. The police arrived and the reality of the situation set in. This wasn't just a story. It was a nightmare come to life. In the aftermath, the young woman was identified as a missing person, last seen with a group known for their occult practices, led by a charismatic man whose description chilled my blood. My encounter was no chance meeting. It was a calculated message, a twisted game of cat and mouse. As the investigation unfolded, the full horror of what had occurred in the shadows of those rural roads emerged. Ritual sites were uncovered, evidence of unspeakable acts laid bare, and the man with the sinister smile was revealed to be the leader of it all, the orchestrator of horrors that defied explanation. He remained elusive, a specter haunting my every thought, a reminder of the thin veil between the ordinary and the macabre. The case grew cold, but the fear, the undeniable truth of evil's presence, lingered, a stark contrast to the peaceful sermons and the safe, illuminated aisles of the church. In the quiet moments, I often find myself staring into the dark, wondering about the nature of good and evil, and the mysterious, terrifying figures who walk the line in between, leaving behind a trail of chaos and fear, worshipping not in churches, but in the darkness that dwells in the human heart. The Circle K sign flickered in the distance, its neon glow a beacon of hope as my car's fuel gauge hovered ominously over empty. I cursed under my breath, blaming my procrastination for the predicament I found myself in. 
The night was unnervingly silent, with only the occasional whoosh of passing cars breaking the stillness. My heart raced as the engine sputtered its last breath, leaving me stranded on the desolate stretch of highway. I reached for my phone, only to be met with the stark reminder of a dead battery. The situation couldn't get any worse, I thought, as I stepped out of the car into the chilling night air. The darkness was oppressive, and every rustle in the nearby trees sent a jolt of fear through me. That's when I saw them, a car slowly approaching, its headlights cutting through the darkness. Relief washed over me as I imagined the help they could offer. Three men stepped out, their faces obscured by the shadows. Something in the way they moved struck me as odd, their steps too silent, their smiles too strained. We saw you were in trouble, the tallest one said, his voice smooth and controlled. Need some help? Desperation clouded my judgment. Yes, please, I ran out of gas. They exchanged glances, a silent conversation passing between them. We can help you out, another one offered, stepping closer. His hand brushed against something metallic at his belt, a glimpse of a knife. My heart skipped a beat as the realization hit me. This was no rescue. The isolated highway, my dead phone, the vulnerable situation, it was the perfect setup for a robbery, or worse. I tried to keep the fear out of my voice. Thanks, but I'll just wait for the tow truck. Their demeanor changed instantly. The friendly facade fell away, replaced by a menacing intensity. We're not offering, buddy. We're insisting, the third man said, his voice cold and threatening. Panic surged through me, adrenaline kicking in. I turned to run, but a strong hand gripped my shoulder, spinning me back. The first punch landed hard against my cheek, sending me to the ground. They were on me in seconds, kicking and punching, each blow a burst of pain in the dim light of the highway. Then, as quickly as it began, the assault stopped. They rummaged through my pockets, taking my wallet, my watch, and even the keys to my now useless car. Their laughter echoed in my ears as they walked away leaving me battered and bruised on the cold asphalt. Lying there, every breath a sharp stab of pain, I thought about how quickly everything had turned. The road, once a path to my destination, had become a scene of horror. I could feel the blood, warm and sticky, pooling beneath me. The fear wasn't just about the physical pain, but the realization of how vulnerable and alone I was. Time lost meaning as I lay there. Was it minutes, hours? The night sky gave no hint, and the occasional car that passed by didn't stop, their drivers oblivious to my plight. The cold seeped into my bones, my shivering the only movement in the still night. Finally, headlights bathed me in light, not the harsh glare of the attacker's car, but the warm glow of a concerned Samaritan. A woman's voice, laced with urgent concern, asked if I was okay. I could barely whisper a response. She didn't hesitate, calling 911 immediately. As I lay waiting for the ambulance, the pain was a constant companion, but so was a new feeling, gratitude. Gratitude for the stranger who decided to stop, who saw me not as a potential threat or inconvenience, but as a human being in need. The horror of that night lingered long after my wounds had healed. The psychological scars, the memories of helplessness and betrayal were harder to mend. Yet, amid the terror, there was a lesson about the unpredictability of life and the thin line between normalcy and nightmare. The experience, harrowing as it was, reminded me of the fragile thread of safety we all hang by and the unexpected kindness that can save us when it snaps.